Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. COVID-19 fears top the list of excuses people are using as reasons why they want to be excused from grand jury duty. And that's according to responses to jury summons that were sent out recently. Paul Venema looks at a cross section of those responses as the jury selection process here begins to slowly ramp up. When the responses to these jury summons that were sent out early this month began to come in, one thing was very clear. I would say that COVID-19 is not only the primary reason, but really the ultimate reason that most individuals have called in and don't want to come. A total of 480 summons were sent seeking jurors for two grand juries. That's a much smaller number than the summons sent for the type of jurors called for trial jury duty. That will not likely happen until September at the earliest. COVID-19 fears were not the only responses to these summons. We're not only getting individuals telling us that they're afraid to come in for fear of catching the virus and taking it home, but they actually have been diagnosed or they've been told that they're positive. Among other responses was one from a senior citizen who wanted to do his civic duty. Even though they can be exempt, they still want to do it, but given the current situation, they don't feel very comfortable um, being here. Tomorrow, Ron Hell will interview the first prospective jurors to show up here since mid-March when the moratorium on jury service was ordered. Paul Venom on KSAT 12 News. A San Antonio bar gets its permit suspended by the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, along with more than a dozen Texas bars and restaurants, after a weekend of undercover operations. Burn House on the city's far north side received a 30-day suspension today. According to the TABC, the bar was not following the protocols set by the state to slow the spread of coronavirus. Bars are allowed to operate at 50% capacity and practice social distancing guidelines. Bird House, one of 17 bars in the state to get those permit suspensions. These undercover operations by the TABC are being carried out by the agency's Operation Open Safe effort. The day after another record-setting day for COVID-19 cases in Bear County, Judge Nelson Wolf's executive order to try and slow the spread of the coronavirus is now in effect. That order requires businesses in Bear County that deal directly with customers to make masks mandatory for employees and customers. Businesses that fail to do so could face a fine of up to $1,000. Judge Wolf issued that order last week as the number of cases in Bear County started spiking. As the state of Texas moved into the third phase of reopening the economy, last night 538 new cases were reported. That's the most ever for a single day in the county. We're expecting an update from the judge and San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg coming up at 613. Today, he called the increase in coronavirus cases across the state unacceptable. Governor Greg Abbott again addressing Texans across the state to express the seriousness of the surge that we are seeing. He joins us now for another Q&A session here on KSAT to talk about these issues. Governor, thanks for being with us again. I'd like to start by talking about some numbers that you put out there today that really raised some eyebrows. The number of hospitalizations, and again, keeping those numbers low was the point of flattening the curve earlier in this pandemic. You said those numbers have doubled since late May from 1600 a day on average people being hospitalized in late May to now 3200 a day in the last few days. You said if those numbers continue to trend upward, tougher actions will be required. What could that look like? First, you're making a very important point that the audience really needs to understand, and that is all of these metrics that we've been talking about, hospitalizations, the positivity rate, and the, the number of people testing positive, they've all pretty much doubled since uh, the, the latter to middle part of May. So people need to understand that COVID-19 is spreading far faster. With regard to the responses of what we can do, some of it has already begun. Uh, one is that uh, we are uh, cracking down at, at bars like what you were talking about because we have seen that bars have not been following the protocols and one way that we can reduce the transmission is by having TABC shut down the bars that are not following the protocols. Secondly, uh, there are many other different types of organizations and businesses that have protocols established for them. If they are not complying with them, they too could perhaps lose their licenses. And then on top of that, we are seeing uh, increased enforcement at, at multiple levels, but I want to finish it with this. 
And that is, let's go back in time to March and April when we did have a slower spread. One thing we were doing at that time, uh, we did a great job of these uh, safe practices of you know, sanitizing your hands, maintaining your distance, and wearing a mask. If we get back to those fundamentals, we can slow the spread. We proved it, we did it before, we can do it again. Governor, are you seeing any uh, common commonality among these cases? I mean, are they coming from, you mentioned bars, are they coming from certain situations? Have we even seen Memorial Day show up in some of these things? Have we seen protests show up in some of these numbers? <laughs> One word answer, yes. So the, the, the deal is, uh, we, we were dealing with several different types of settings in late May, jails and nursing homes, for example, and some of these tests still are filtering some of those results in. But uh, this is largely a, as a result of celebrations that took place on Memorial Day, uh, the opening of, of bars. Uh, there, there is, uh, interestingly, across the state of Texas, uh, in many counties, more than half of the people testing positive are under the age of 30. One of the things that we've seen here is that uh, there's a return to school in some respects at, at athletic programs where a lot of players and a lot of different sports, when they go back, they're all tested and many are testing positive. They were, may, may have been asymptomatic before that. Some are testing positive who go to bars. Some are testing positive who are going to these uh, tubing or river rafting places. And uh, as a result, uh, we are able to identify more people who are testing positive. The good news, if you want to uh, take a silver lining out of this, is uh, because about half the people testing positive now are under 30, they are less likely to need to go to a hospital and certainly less likely to face the consequence of death. Some of the doctors who appeared with you in the press conference today talked about the possibility of surging resources to San Antonio and Bear County. What's the communication been like with your office about uh, the state of hospital capacity here locally for us? Pretty much constant. So our, our doctors, that was Dr. Zerwas, who was one of those people talking, the others, Dr. Helderstedt, who's the head of the State Department of State Health Services, uh, they talk uh, pretty much daily. Uh, with all the hospital leaders around the state. Uh, I do it pretty much weekly. Uh, I did it last week. I'm, I'm going to be doing it again this week uh, to make sure we know exactly what the hospitalization situation is, to make sure they have the supplies they need and the capabilities that may be needed by the community to make sure that people who test positive for COVID-19 will have a bed to go to. Uh, you know, they called it stay home, work safe in San Antonio. Uh, some of the orders when they asked people to, to kind of stay home. Are we heading back in that direction or what do we need to see before you say, you know what, I think it's time to just kind of clamp down a little bit? The way that it's structured there in Bear County is, is the right approach. and I'm glad you brought it up. And that's one of the safest things that really the safest thing that you can do is to stay at home. And this is not a mandatory stay at home order. However, uh, everyone can control their own health by making sure they do not expose themselves to COVID-19 by choosing to stay at home and, unless you have to get out. If you do have to get out, then practice these safe practices like wearing a face mask. And you can make sure that you do not contract it and you do not give it to anybody else if you very simply follow those safe practices. But do, are we heading towards mandatory orders if we don't get some of this, you know, some of this curve flattened? Listen, if, if, if the voluntary participation or the types of rules established in San Antonio uh, don't bend the curve. If, if the crackdown on the bars uh, and other uh, places where there's overcrowding, if, if they don't help bend the curve, then yes, stiffer measures will be required. Governor Greg Abbott, live from Austin. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Governor. You have probably noticed on your grocery receipt, beef prices are going up. In fact, in the month of May, that we saw the biggest monthly price jump ever, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. We tracked a few local supermarket prices and found that since early May, the price of a pound of ground chuck rose from $4 a pound to $4.62. Choice ribeye also jumped by $2 a pound. As meat prices continue to stabilize, nutritionists say that you can save by perhaps rethinking your grilling menu. Think about using it as an opportunity to develop a healthy habit, eating less meat. Eating less meat can lead to a healthy and more sustainable diet, and diets low in meat that focus on fruits, vegetables, and a variety of plant proteins are consistently tied to better health. She also adds trying to bulk up smaller portions of ground beef with chopped mushrooms, perhaps, or even try tofu as a meat replacement. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go to I-10 and Loop 410. You can see we're actually looking down Loop 410 and not a lot of traffic problems out there to tell you about, but it is a warm one.
Adam Casco have your forecast coming up. Meanwhile, in about 12 hours, we're going to have results from our third Bear Facts KSAT Rivard Report poll this year. It's going to be released. This poll covering the protests while we're in the midst of a pandemic. We're also taking a look at the intersection of race and policing. As a matter of fact, we're going to hold a virtual town hall to talk about these poll results and those two subjects tomorrow night. We're going to cover more than just the numbers. San Antonio's police chief, the mayor, Bear County's district attorney, all scheduled to be a part of tomorrow's discussion as well as people on the ground. Some of those who organize some of the protests that we've seen around the Bear County Courthouse and police headquarters. We've also asked you to send in your questions about race and policing. We'd love to still have them. The live discussion will begin tomorrow at 630 on air and online. We'll also be live streaming the event on KSAT TV. Meantime, a look outside with live cam this evening. 96 degrees out there, but it's feeling hotter than that, Adam. Oh, it sure is. We're feeling like it's over 100 as a result of the high heat and the humidity. All right, take a look at the aquifer. It's down six tenths of a foot today. We're at 661.0. Take a look at our pollen count. Three allergens, mold, pigweed, and grass, all low, 98. That was our high temperature today after a morning low of 78. I don't think it's going to be as hot the rest of the week, but we do have some better rain chances than what we had last week. We'll talk about that and some African dust arrives. All that coming right up. Cases over the last week is indeed a cause for concern. So starting today, Judge Wolf and I will be back Monday through Friday providing updates from the city and the county's effort to contain COVID-19 in San Antonio. Before we get into today's numbers, let's go over those key indicators that we told you we'd be updating every week with warnings that our public health officials are tracking throughout this week. The first progress indicator we're looking at is cases over two weeks, which is charted by the onset of symptoms. As you can see by this chart, cases are increasing at a significant pace each day. We're not close at all to meeting our goal of seeing a sustained decline in cases over the next two weeks. And the increase will continue unless we work together to contain the virus. We're also seeing uh, continued increasing testing capacity, which is good. Last week, our capacity was just under 4,000 tests per day. Effective today, all public and private testing sites in Bear County will have the collective capacity to test at least 5,200 people per day. Additionally, walk-up testing will be expanded to six days per week, Monday through Saturday. Locations and times of walk-up tests are posted on covid19.sanantonio.gov. And remember, if you think you need a test, start with the online self-screening tool. The tool doesn't replace a doctor, but it might give you some peace of mind as to whether or not you actually do need a test. If you have access to insurance, you can always seek a test from your local health care provider. No cost options, though, are listed at covid19.sanantonio.gov. Let's move over now to contact tracing. Our need for case investigators, those people that look into each and every single case that comes up in our community, is higher than what we are currently have to meet the need. This is being addressed as a priority issue to bring on more trained staff to meet the need for both tasks, especially the need for case investigators that need to interview the large number of incoming positives each day. And you can visit our website for opportunities to uh, be part of that effort as well. If you get a call from Metro Health's contact tracing team, it's very important. Pick up the phone. The information you share with us helps contain the spread of COVID-19 and the safety of your neighbors depends on it. Let's go over now to patient trends. The number of patients hospitalized, as you see, is on a steep up uptick in ICU or on ventilators as well due to COVID-19 related complications as they all go up at a, an alarming rate. The number of people ending up in hospitals because of COVID-19 has more than doubled in the past week. The number of ICU has also close to doubled, and the number on ventilators has more than tripled since last week. The surge we're seeing is not just about new cases, it's about the severity of the disease that is tracking along with the growth in case numbers. Let's go now to doubling time, how long it takes to for the infections total in our community to double. That continues to show a disturbing nature of the current disease spread. As of this week, the doubling time is now 13 days, which is well below the warning threshold of 18 days that we had set up to watch for. This means that there is an exponential rise in infection rate continuing, even 
even more prominently this week as compared to last week. It also means your risk of catching the infection goes up as you see that doubling time go down. The positivity rate, COVID-19 weekly positivity rate, which is a percentage of lab tests that are positive for COVID-19, has also almost doubled a second week in a row, standing now at 17%. That is a, a concern because when we started this, we were at 11%. We had gone all the way down to about 3.5%. And as you can see now, last week, we are at 17% positive. Let's go over now to our hospitals. Tonight, you'll see a new layout of the STRAC health system score. The score is calculated by looking at Bear County acute care hospitals in the area and has switched to an easier to follow three color score. The, currently, the score is currently at the high stress level because of the surge in hospitalizations and the surge in the number of people ending up in ICU or on ventilators. So here's the bottom line. Exponential surge in COVID-19 cases in San Antonio. Almost all of the progress and warning indicators without a a doubt show the alarming nature of this. Second, the number of people ending up in the hospital, in the ICU, or on ventilators is also dramatically rising. More people will end up in critical condition if proper action is not taken to prevent the spread of this disease from devastating our communities, our health, and our livelihood. So let's go to the actual numbers today. There are 274 more cases of COVID-19 in San Antonio, which brings us to a total of 7,156 total cases. 446 patients are now in the hospital, 40 from, uh, 40, uh, up 40 from yesterday. Of those, 124 are in the hospital, um, down from 133, excuse me, ICU, down from 133 yesterday. 60 are on ventilators, down from four yesterday. So let me move over to Judge Nelson Wolf. Uh, those, those numbers are really, really disturbing there. And it, let me remind everybody, it's affecting everyone regardless of the age. Um, since we've uh, tracked the people that have been in the hospitals <clears throat> uh, going up to June 22nd, uh, there's 15 people that have been in there that are below 19 years old. There's 41 that are 20 to 29. There's 84 of them, 30 to 39. 106, 40 to 49. 121, 50 to 59. So everybody's getting affected by this. And and so it's very, very dangerous and we have to take every step we can. We started today with a new effort that the mayor and I put in place uh, with respect to requiring businesses to put up their their sign warning people that they have to wear a mask at least to come in and also to not only develop their policy but to implement that policy. Uh, Today we had eight deputies uh, working all day long going out. I think they hit somewhere between 80 to 100 different establishments. And just give you a couple of ideas of how how things, some of the smaller businesses may not be up to date on things as much. Uh, One of them had an old sign up, so we gave them the new sign to put up, which is larger. Although everybody in there had a mask on except for the cook, which is the one that really should have it on more than anybody probably. And so they made sure he got one on. At another restaurant they went to, uh, they didn't have the sign up at all. So they put up the sign and told the, told the person what was happening, and they agreed with it. They stopped by, one of them stopped by an HEB on military in Pleasanton, and uh, they've gone to extraordinary means. Not only do they have huge signs up, they have people standing in front of the store saying you should put a mask on before you come in here. They've had the social distancing. Uh, they've got plexiglass up at the uh, over the counter, so they're setting the gold standard about how we ought to do in that. But we'll continue each day to monitor and to uh, uh, make sure that the businesses are following uh, the, the guidelines of what we both set out. All right, thank you, Judge. And, and we're not going to sugarcoat this. We promised you uh, to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. The, the, the public health professionals are here pro- giving us the proper guidance, and these numbers are not good. We need everyone to work together, all the things that we had been doing from the start, to make sure that we limit the spread of this virus so we can all make it through this okay. But it's clear we're going to have to live with this virus some time before there's a vaccine, so it's incumbent upon everyone to do. The very latest there from Bear County and City of San Antonio leaders about the continued rise in coronavirus cases, 274 new cases since yesterday. But perhaps the most alarming is that number of people in the hospital that continues to rise. That number now at 446 patients in the hospital. But the stat that the mayor released this evening is certainly eye-opening. The number of hospitalizations has more than doubled in a week 
and the number of people on ventilators has more than tripled in that same time period. Yeah, and that's what he led this news conference with. But as a matter of fact, he's also saying that, you know, they kind of tapered back these news conferences to a couple of times a week. They are now going back to Monday through Friday, updating the public on the numbers 274 today. We are now over 7,156 cases. It's the exact number of cases we have 446 hospitalized. That is also up 40. And he said there's a high stress level right now on uh, the emergency rooms and the hospital staff in San Antonio. Uh, the 17% positivity rate for last week is much higher than they've been seeing. Uh, again, they are testing more people, but what I'm looking at is a positivity rate and the number of hospitalizations. And when you have a, a positivity rate above 17%, when it was down to something like 4% at one time, mm -hmm. that shows you the severity of what we're dealing with. And uh, yeah, I mean, the mayor said it, the hospital trends are going up at an alarming rate. And that's something that they have said all along throughout this entire ordeal is that the hospitalization rate is the key indicator they are looking at as to how this virus is spreading and its severity. You know, everybody's getting affected by this. The words of Nelson Wolf, he also pointed out that there are eight Bear County Sheriff's deputies that visited about 80 different establishments today to just see how they were doing under the new uh, requirement for employees and those who are customers to wear masks and he gave a little bit of an update on that. We can continue to hear these updates again as Steve said every day throughout the week because they are ramping up this information as those numbers continue to rise. We'll be right back. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL is mandating that all 32 NFL teams develop an infectious disease emergency response plan that sets in motion protocols in case of an outbreak of the coronavirus. And at the same time, the league is ordering that all teams develop a tier system that restricts access to personnel of where they can go in the team facilities and what they can do. That's according to a memo sent to all NBA or NFL teams, and that was obtained by ESPN. Teams must assign employees here access, and they will have to wear photo credentials detailing where they're allowed to do, and that includes access to stadium and practice fields, sidelines, locker rooms, and training rooms. NFL teams must assign their players and employees tier one, two, or three status, and those assignments have to be in the league office for approval seven days before the first mandatory reporting date for training camp. While no official date has been approved by the league so far for the start of camps, Dallas and Houston are scheduled to be two of the first right now. Here are the different tiers broken down. It starts with the tier one access as players, coaches, trainers, physicians, and necessary personnel who must have direct access to the players. Tier two, general managers, football operations employees, other assistant coaches, video personnel, security, and other essential personnel who may need to be in close proximity to the players and other tier one individuals. And tier three, operational personnel, in-house media, broadcast personnel, field manager, transportation providers, and individuals who perform essential facilities stadium or event services, but do not require close contact with tier one individuals. The NFL and the NFL Players Association says it will conduct surprise inspections of team facilities to make sure they are following the required new protocols. Dak Prescott has signed his franchise tag today that will pay him $31.4 billion for the coming season. What that does immediately is that allows Prescott to report for any virtual instructions and more importantly makes him available for the opening of training camp and a new head coach Mike McCarthy. Still gives the Cowboys and Dak's representatives until July 15 to work out a new long-term contract with Prescott's people wanting just a four-year deal while the Cowboys just insisting on five. By the way, Dak wants to be the highest paid quarterback in the league, which would mean his average salary would have to be greater than $35 million a year, which is what Russell Wilson is making in Seattle. After demanding to trade last Thursday, Jet Safety Jamal Adams was spotted in the Dallas area over the weekend and was recorded on cell phone video replying to a question from a fan. You coming to Dallas? I'm trying, bro, was his response. Adams is upset that the Jets have not negotiated a new long-term deal, even though he still has two years left on his rookie contract. He wants to be the highest paid safety in the league that will put him over $14 million this season. Right now, his contract calls for him to be paid $3.5 million this season and close to $10 million in 2021. Adams grew up in the Dallas area, but the Jets have not granted permission for a trade, so any discussions would be considered tampering. Former Spur Davis Bertans has informed the Washington Wizards he will not participate in the restart of the NBA next month. Today is a day that NBA players who are part of the 22-team restart in Orlando, Florida, were set to report to their teams. Bertans has decided not to. Bertans, who played for the Spurs starting in 2016, was traded the Washington Wizards, Wizards last summer to make room for Marcus Morris, who later reneged on his two-year $20 million deal with the Spurs to sign with the Knicks for one-year $15 million. Bertans, who is an unrestricted free agent this summer, is coming off a career year 
year, averaging almost 16 points a game and shooting almost 42.5% from three-point range and doesn't want to take any chances. And finally, congratulations go out to former Spur Malik Rose, a two-time NBA champion in 99 and 2003, has been named vice president of back basketball operations in the NBA. Rose will be responsible for interfacing direction with the teams and players regarding league programs, rules, new initiatives, and competitive elements. So quite the promotion for Mr. Malik. Congratulations Indeed. to him. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. How do you talk to kids about what is happening in our world, whether it's what happened with George Floyd, whether it's COVID-19? There are just so many different aspects and different things out there that have parents and grandparents and, you know, people just scratching their heads on what's the best way to answer some of these questions and broach these subjects. So we are joined by Dr. Lulu, a pediatrician. She is with the youth, Dr. Lulu's Youth Health Center. It's in Holotus here in San Antonio. Doctor, thank you for joining us. The first question is, how do you talk to kids about current events? Well, it's the same way you talk to them about chicken and rice and lollipops. I mean, you just talk to them, just literally just talk to them. Kids are little SpongeBob's and SpongeBobettes is what I like to call them. So they want to hear what you have to say. If it's a two-year-old child, break it down to two-year-old little size, bite sizes. If it's a 12-year-old, come out and say it. If it's a 22-year-old, come out and say it. I think kids want honesty and vulnerability from their parents. They want you to be as honest as possible. Don't sugarcoat it because what's going to happen is the child is going to go outside and get the adulterated version. Is that the word I'm looking for? Yes. And then you, you can't unadulterate it. Does that make sense? So give them everything you want them to know, the way you would explain to them about crossing the street when there's a car coming, look both ways and then cross the street, something like that. Listen, there are people in this world who look like us, if you're white, if, if you're black, you look like us. It depends on what side of the aisle you're talking, you're talking from. If, it's, if you're white, say people like us, use words like we and us, as opposed to them and they, like it's over there. When it's really people like grandma and grandpa and Uncle Buck and Aunt Susan, come out and just tell them honestly. If it's a two-year-old, you probably don't want to go into deep details, but they know the word mean. Five-year-olds know understand the word mean, so they say, say very mean people, things like that. And then if it's a 12-year-old, come out and call it racism already, because these kids literally are having these conversations already in their little clicks, in their little phone chats. They are seeing what's happening. So if you give them the wrong information, they're going to be like, mom, seriously? So-and-so uh, told me so-and-so. And so that's one of the reasons why you need to educate yourself and then find out what your kids already know. And then maybe you can fix what you have to fix and then let them unlearn what they need to unlearn. But essentially educate yourself first and then come to their own level and use the same words you would use to describe chicken or, I don't know, breakfast, something. Make it easy for them to understand. It's probably harder for us to, to begin these conversations than it is for them to hear these things. You talk about different ages, and when we talk about race and racial inequality, those are heavy subjects. What ages do you think it's appropriate to begin having those conversations with kids? I think once they get to kindergarten. So basically, at six months old, a baby can recognize differences in race, believe it or not, in skin color, they can. While they're not gonna say anything, they can tell, okay? A, an 18 month old can also understand that you were kind of weird acting to that person. They don't know how to phrase it, but a four year old who is in kindergarten knows that that kid over there is new or that kid over there, someone is being mean to them. And then they now kind of put it together. Well, it's the same color kid that so-and-so happened to last week. They start putting it together. So I say once they can go to school, especially kindergarten, it's time to start talking about it. But the best way to teach a child is to lead by example. If your child sees you speaking Spanish, like I speak Spanish to my kids. So they grew up knowing that I speak Spanish and French and, and Nigerian languages, about five of them. They know that I'm open to that, right? So they know that. 
So it was easy for my eldest son to take, to take French and for his brother to take Latin and for the baby to take Spanish because they know their mom is a polyglot. So they know that I already accept that. So by living, living exactly how you want the child to be, your child will learn better than anything you can tell them with words. This is a true statement. Now, I know that I know that you have things on your website and you have some publications out there that can answer a lot of these questions for parents. But I know also that you have faced some of these things head on with your children coming back, asking you questions about what amounted to be profiling, correct? Yes. As a matter of fact, I, I get very emotional when I talk to my kids. So if I start crying, just know that I have tissue on the side. Um, we've, we've lived here for almost 10 years now. I went, I was active duty. I was commander at Lackland Air Force Base. I was medical director. I have lived here. My boys went to school here, elementary school, middle school, high school. We have lived in this neighborhood. But a few weeks ago, they went running in the neighborhood. And don't you know, someone called the popo on my boys. And the police got a marked police vehicle, followed them slowly all the way home. Why do you think that happened? This was soon after Ahmad Arbery's case came out. My boys grew up here. I mean, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. Needless to say, I don't have that talk with my kids anymore. And I tell people that I don't, I don't know how to tell my son to be who he is. Like, whether he's putting his hand on his steering wheel, or he's playing in his backyard, or he's sleeping in his bedroom. If someone wants to kill him, they're going to kill him. So it's very emotional for me to talk about. It's very sad that this is a situation, but it's also very true and very raw. But I don't want us to approach it like, oh, it's a big thing. No, let's approach it like the way you eat a big sandwich, one bite at a time. Let's start with us. Start with you, yourself. And then, of course, your family members. Everyone knows the family member who is uh, out there. We all know them. And start trying to talk to them and start trying to be the change, which is what everybody talks about. Be the change, be the change. Well, how about practicing being the change for a, for a change, you know? So, yeah, my boys were profiled. It was very, very emotional. My eldest, who, so, who just graduated from Stanford, he will not go running in the neighborhood anymore. He's very afraid right now. And a child should not live that way. That is wrong. Another reason why these conversations need to be happening in our homes, and you have helped us with some information and advice on how to get that conversation started. Thanks for your time, Dr. Lulu. We'll continue this conversation tonight on the Night Beat at 10. Thank you, Dr. Lulu. And I'm going to ask her to pronounce her name for me at 10 o'clock, too, because there's no way I can do it. Again, Dr. Lulu with the Youth Health Center, Dr. Lulu's Youth Health Center of San Antonio. We'll be right back. Another Disney park announcing a phased reopening in the coming weeks. This one in Europe. Disneyland Paris has targeted July 15th as the day. On Twitter, the company said it would begin reopening with Disneyland Park, Walt Disney Studios Park, Disney's Newport Bay Club Hotel, and Disney Village. And like all Disney parks around the world, Disneyland Paris closed due to the coronavirus. France currently in phase three of its countrywide reopening. Back here at home, we'll look outside with live cam. We continue to talk about the humidity, but is it just me or is it just really ramping up right now? It's pretty high. Yeah, usually we say the humidity mix out a little bit in the afternoon, but that really wasn't the case today. So heat indices were on the order of about 105, 106 this afternoon. As for this evening, just warm and muggy. 96 right now we will be near 90 at 8 p.m. and then falling through the 80s gradually overnight. And we'll wake up to temperatures in the mid to upper 70s tomorrow morning. Better rain chances this week. Also some African dust to talk about of all the details coming right up. For years, Hamilton was the hottest theater ticket in town. Any town sold out wherever it played. But now the movie version is coming to houses around the country through Disney Plus. The trailer for the film is out now. Yeah, it shows a montage of scenes set up to mash up of the show's opening number, Alexander Hamilton, and satisfied in the lead role, of course, Lin-Manuel Miranda, who also created the musical. It won 11 Tony Awards, including Best Musical. The movie's theatrical release initially set for October of 2021. The studio opted to release the film early on its subscription streaming service amid the coronavirus pandemic, and I still haven't seen it. Me either. Yeah. But now maybe I can because we watch a lot of Disney Plus in my house. There you go. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the weather now. Adam, outside. 
Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, definitely because the added humidity and it was a hot one today. I mean, we made it to 98 degrees for the high temperature. So definitely uh, feeling the heat out there today. That was our high locally elsewhere. We did have some readings that were warmer than that triple digits southwest of San Antonio, but that's not the case here around town. All right, let's get to our satellite and radar and notice earlier this morning we had some activity that was east of San Antonio. It amounted to a few hundredths of an inch for most locations. One rain gauge in Lavaca County had about a quarter of an inch, but for the most part, it was very brief. Better than nothing, though. Houston area and that part of the I-10 corridor got a better soaking, much better soaking. Good rainfall for them. At least somebody got some rain. And even up in the Dallas area earlier today and late last night, they had those showers and storms, parts of East Texas cashing in. We really need it in the panhandle and they're getting some moisture. This is coming in the form of severe thunderstorms at the moment. And what we're watching is for the development of a complex of storms in North Texas to drop southward and then we could get the leftovers, the remnant showers of that by early tomorrow morning. So let's go through time. This is just one example of what could happen overnight tonight and into tomorrow. And that's that complex coming together by midnight, basically between San Angelo and Dallas. So that would be 2 a.m. And then by about sunrise tomorrow morning, we could have a few leftover showers around here, maybe some cracks of thunder. Don't be surprised, just scattered in nature. And then by the midday, some sunshine, leading to a few pop up downpours with a little bit of lightning and thunder. And that's the possibility. We have that 40% chance here. So that's scattered activity basically every day all the way through Friday. But we're also going to add to that some of the Saharan air layer, the Saharan dust, and it's thick right now. You look at Puerto Rico and you can really see here moving into the Caribbean, that thicker dust in place coming off the coast of Africa. We talked about it last week. It's been slowly moving across the Atlantic. Well, it's almost here and it's going to make it here, we think, by about tomorrow evening, just in small concentrations. So we'll put this into motion here and you'll see that that thicker concentration, the more dense dust will likely move in as we get on into Thursday and Friday. Either way, once it's here, it's likely going to be here to stay. Now, the exact concentration is going to vary, but it's going to be here for the rest of the week and likely through the weekend as well. Now, for most of us, that just means noticing extra haze in the sky and more vibrant sunrises and sunsets. But some folks with sensitive respiratory systems can be affected by this. So it is something to keep in mind for sure. But, you know, we talk about this African dust I and mean, it comes every year. It's every summertime, the Saharan air layer and it's nothing new. It's not a big dust storm, just that added haze in the air and some folks that are sensitive to it uh, may get some symptoms. So keep that in mind. Temperatures right now still 100 Carrizo Springs, 103 in Del Rio, but we have that humidity. Dewey's right now, low to mid 70s for a good portion of us. So this is what it feels like. New Braunfels heat index of 106. Del Rio feels like 108 get into San Antonio and our heat index is 104. So we're feeling that heat out there with that humidity. And as we go through the night tonight, just increasing clouds tomorrow, mostly cloudy to start the day 78 in the morning, 94 by the afternoon, that 40% chance for the first part of the day, then a 30% chance as we get into the afternoon and we'll maintain that 40% chance daily all the way through Friday. Temperatures should also take a bit of a hit as well. A little closer to 90 for highs by Wednesday through Friday. So overall, with that uh, dust, we could get some muddy rain, something to keep in mind when those showers develop. That's such a weird phenomenon. It is, but it's fascinating. It too. is. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. We hope you had a great Father's Day weekend. Good morning to you. It is Monday. It is June 22nd. A woman is recovering in the hospital this morning after she was shot twice overnight. Police tell us it happened just before 4 this morning in the 3300 block of Jenkins Drive. That's on the northeast side. Now, according to police, the victim, along with two other witnesses, were being uncooperative and not giving much information as to what exactly happened. The investigation is ongoing. The block party turned violent and then deadly in North Carolina this morning. There were two dead and nearly a dozen injured. Some by gunfire and some were hit by cars speeding away from the scene. It was a continuation of a Juneteenth party over the weekend. Police first carved out for a hit and run. When they got to the scene, they found hundreds of people hanging out in the streets. While they were there, they heard the gunshots. Police say there were several shooters and dozens of shots were fired. 
A female shot died at the scene. Another victim pronounced dead at the hospital. There were several others wounded. A petition to rename the city of Columbus, Ohio, has more than 17,000 signatures. The new proposed name, Flavortown. Christopher Columbus is criticized for his cruelty to indigenous people, so the city has taken down his statue from in front of City Hall. The name Flavortown honors celebrity, foodie, and Columbus native Guy Fieri. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar providing an update on the COVID-19 at the county jail. As of today, Salazar says 33 inmates currently in custody have COVID-19. That brings the cumulative total to 473 inmates who have tested positive. Salazar saying today he believes the majority of those 33 cases were not contracted inside the jail. Hot and sticky out there. This is the heat index, so it feels like 106 Del Rio. Right now in San Antonio, it feels like 101. Tomorrow morning, we'll wake up to temperatures in the mid to upper 70s. Some scattered showers and storms possible, not just in the morning, but even later on in the day. And that scattered activity, the periodic chances will be daily all the way through Friday. Add to it some Saharan dust, which we do see every year here, and it may meet, make for some muddy showers later this week by Thursday and Friday. All right, thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news at six. See you back here on the night beat at 10.